continue the debate, I now look to Professor William Kovacek to continue the case for proposition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the honor of participating in the discussion this evening. AP, just to be clear, I never got it wrong. Never. My colleagues did, but I didn't. <laughs> I was only one of five, and I assure you, the day will come when I'll make a mistake, and it will be hard to swallow. But it hasn't happened yet, just to clarify that part of regulation. I want to talk about four problems that I think cause concern and warrant our support for the proposition. And lest you be cast out into the night in a state of absolute gloom, I'm going to leave you with a ray of hope about how things could turn out and more approach the vision that our colleagues have mentioned. The first problem is the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Last summer, the chair of the House Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust, Commercial, and Administrative Law held a hearing in which he brought together the leaders of the famous four. I feel so bad for Microsoft. They often get marginalized, as my students put it, so yesterday in the face of the other four. Uh, they were all brought together. Now, 10 years ago, that would have been an occasion for the celebration of celebrities. Here's what our exalted legislators would have asked. Mr. Zuckerberg, tell us how you became so wonderful. Mr. Bezos, how is it possible to be so spectacularly successful? And then, after that hardball line of questioning, they'd rush to the witness and say, can we take your picture with us? 10 years ago. What happened last summer? The opening question from the chair to the CEO of Alphabet, parent of Google, was, why are you still stealing? And in many instances, the executives were asked, those of you who are studying English as a second language, I just want to let you know in the United States, that's not a sign of favorable recognition. Why are you stealing is an uncommonly harsh way to begin the questioning. So in this instance, they went on because they were very well prepared. They had documents from inside the company's records, and they were asked again and again, what about this element of misconduct? What, Mr. Zuckerberg, about the Instagram merger? What about each of these steps? And what was the most frequent answer? I don't know. I'm not sure. Now, I used to spend part of my life counseling people who were appearing under oath, which they were, to be very careful in answering questions. If you don't know, don't guess. And if you don't know, say, I don't know, and I'll find out later. But in watching this, and they were well prepared in that respect, the realization dawned on me that they don't know that in fundamental ways, they don't know. And it makes you wonder who's minding the store. And in key respects, firms have become so big, so fast, so complex, that they defy effective human management. I saw this when I was at the FTC. One leading tech company had what we call a get to know you visit. They come to your office and say, here are the great things we're doing. And in this instance, laid out the business's philosophy, said, we're in a business where if you're not innovating and coming up with something that our young users regard as cool stuff, every six months we're brain dead. And we have to rush things out, and if there's a problem, we'll fix it later. Well, what happens if fix it later does not take place? And that we're rushing to do so many things on a grand scale that later never happens and things break apart. And in many respects, I attribute the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal to exactly this phenomenon, not going back and fixing it to make sure that safeguards are in place. In many respects, with immense power, the costs of not being able to manage these mechanisms become more severe for all of us. Because the very mechanisms that AP referred to, the good things can become bases for corruption, misconduct. And that's the deeper concern if nobody is minding the store, the sorcerer's apprentice. Second problem, historical amnesia. <clears throat> One thing that you hope with firms that are engaged in such remarkable technological progress, and it exists, 
is that there is an awareness of what happens when you push the state of the art aggressively at every moment, that if you don't have someone around asking what could go wrong, what might happen, you drive the technology in directions that ultimately can destroy you. In the 1950s, as a reaction to the horror of the atomic bombings of Japan, the United States government began a program to ensure that the benefits of nuclear power to generate positive research in electricity would be made widely available. It was a program called Atoms for Peace. And the US government commitment was, if you have a suitable research program, we will build a research reactor in your country. Many countries got them. Who got them, among others, India, Israel, Pakistan, research reactors. Do you want to connect the dots there? This was done for the best motives. But nobody was thinking, what happens if you deploy the technology in an extraordinary way without safeguards to make sure at each moment that it's used the way you want? The question I'd ask about the companies is, how good is your history team? How many historians do you have on staff to guide you? to let you think in a positive way about what's happened before and to anticipate problems. Third problem, an unvirtuous quality control cycle. I'd like to believe that their virtues are noble. And the best cycle for experimentation is followed by assessment and improvement. And in particular, when you discover that your business model has serious flaws, you fix it and disclose the flaws to your users. You do not identify a problem that shows that you have a unique capability to appeal to the basest prejudices of individuals, to peer into everybody's soul, into the crevices of doubt, anxiety, fear, and to exploit it by pitching messages to them that reinforce their doubts at a time when society desperately needs the ability to have people revisit assumptions and take the ideas that you hold so precious and dear, especially doubts about other human beings, and to rethink. And a business model that prospers by pitching messages to them to say, you're right. In fact, you don't know how bad the other guys are. You don't fully understand how malicious and malevolent they are. If you know that, I think you have an incumbent duty to fix that and to let your users know as though you were making a pro pro product that might be wonderful, but it has a serious flaw. You put a warning on the products that says hazard. This may not be good for you, depending on how it's used over time. I'll give you an example of a virtuous cycle. A UK company named de Havilland in the early 1950s, launched a miraculous aircraft called the Comet. It was the first commercial airliner powered by jets. De Havilland did it. It was an exceptional breakthrough. But then, in a tragic set of developments, two of them fell apart over the Eastern Mediterranean. They disintegrated. What did De Havilland, what did BOAC, as they were known at the time, did they pull them all out of service? They put one in a big water tank and replicated the process of pressurization and depressurization until they identified the problem. It was an unforeseeable problem that if you have square corners on windows and access panels, those are vulnerable to cracking. That if you punch rivets into metal instead of drilling first, you have small fractures and what sadly happened in these planes is they just peeled apart. What did de Havilland and BOAC did? They put everything in the public domain. They said, this is what we have learned. Next time you're sitting in a commercial airliner, you'll know that they're ovals. They're round. They are not square with right angles. And the whole commercial sector prospered because of it. Boeing, McDonnell Douglas would never have been the firms they were had it not been for this revelation. That's a virtuous cycle. Not sitting on it, hiding it, and figuring out, is there still a better way where we can get a little bit more money from the people who have anxieties? Fourth problem, manifest destiny. Now, ambition is a vital element of the drive of human beings. If Charles Lindbergh had said, oh, I'll never make it to Paris, why don't I just fly to Newfoundland and go home? Uh, I don't know if I'd have gotten here yesterday. 
By the way, not to spoil it, he made it. He got to Paris. He did. But he had ambition and realism and drive, but also great humility about what he was facing. And in this instance, I fear that a consequence of great success, extraordinary wealth at an early age gives you a sense of invincibility. And you listen to people tell you, Mark, you probably ought to be the president of the United States, which he was hearing 10 years ago. There is an exception to the historical amnesia I mentioned before. What have these companies learned? Well, they've learned how to exclude. They know that the firm that could get you is the small firm that's got a nice idea, not coming right at you. It's not a frontal assault. They're going to come from the side. And you go looking for them, and you buy them. Instagram's an example. You also learn that in the history of good competition, policy exclusion, the best method are exclusive contracts that bind firms upstream and downstream to deal only with you, making it harder for everyone else to work. My goodness, they learned that history they've got down perfectly. And the danger, again, is if you behave that way, the perception of irresponsibility brings you right to the edge of comprehensive controls that could destroy everything AP was talking about before. Last problem, it's an impaired regulatory state. There's a welter of activity, but as you know, activity isn't the same thing as accomplishment. What's going to come from all of this? And although as citizens, we love to see our government perform well, we don't want to pay for it. Okay, fellow hypocrites, if you look at what these agencies face and the coins from the pocket that we apply, well, you have a mismatch that is brutal and crippling. And I'll say that one reason to think that we will not get the requisite appropriate policy responses is that we don't want to pay for it. We want to drive a modern Mercedes Chagan and we want to pay for a depreciated Chevrolet. And we can't imagine why we don't get a Mercedes sedan. 15,000 pounds, that's what you want to spend. It's 150,000. The bright light to end with. And that's what's happening in the UK. It's called the Competition and Markets Authority. It's the best competition agency on the planet today. And I've seen a lot of them. It's better than the ones I worked for before. Perfect human beings, no, but in my business, we grade on a curve. So the relevant question is, compared to what? They've hired lots of technologists to know what they're looking at. They have built a foundation of knowledge through market studies to understand the sectors. And they have a nuanced approach to understand what's taking place here. And it's happening, and it's made in the United Kingdom. They have a real chance to lead the world in how to think about this. That's a reason to get up in the morning with a smile on your face. Thank you.